All right, it looks like our numbers are slowing down, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as you can see on our screen, we have a lot of great speakers today. Um, this is the webinar on buildings, um, this chapter specifically in America's Zero Carbon Action Plan. Um, we have Benjamin Prosky from the uh, American Institute of Architects in New York and the Center for Architecture who's going to kick us off. Um, following that, we have Professor Jeffrey Sachs um, from uh, the president of SDSN and Columbia University, um, and then Lori Kerr from the LQ Policy Lab and Roger Platt from the U.S. Green Buildings Council. Um, we'll dive into the specifics of this chapter uh, following Professor Sachs, and then we will have a Q&A at the end. Uh, be sure to insert your questions into the Q&A box throughout the entirety of the webinar. We will be looking at those and we will ask those at the end. And then for those of you who are looking to get AIA continuing education credits, um, you can do so using the form that has just been put into the chat. Um, you must attend 75% of the webinar and complete that form uh, to get your uh, continuing education credits. Um, so without further ado, now that all the housekeeping is out of the way, I'm happy to pass it off to, uh, to Ben to get us started. Thank you so much, Shayan. Um, I'm so pleased that we're collaborating on this. I'm Ben Prosky, Executive Director of uh, AIA New York and the Center for Architecture. So if you're not familiar with us, AIA is a professional association representing and supporting designers and architects through advocacy, continuing education, and advancing the work in critical areas uh, such as climate action and resilient design. Our local chapter has close to 6,000 members who through over 25 program committees organize educational events, workshops, and discussions. AIA and NOI's partner organization, the Center for Architecture, focuses on public outreach, reaching beyond the architectural community to all who experience architecture to educate and activate people to understand how design is a powerful tool which can improve conditions for living, learning, and even more. I want to briefly tell you about a new project that we are about to launch. Now that we are inching past the federal elections, phew, uh, on November 16th, AIA, NY, and the Center for Architecture, in collaboration with MIT's Civic Data Design Lab, are launching a new project that looks forward to New York City's next mayoral election in 2021. We visualize NYC 2021, the project, will present a series of questions, studies, and data sets that will help us understand what issues are germane to design in the city and must be addressed by a new administration and city council. We are starting this project a year ahead of these unprecedented city elections as not only will the mayor and all the borough presidents change, but more than 40 city council seats will turn over. So I invite you to join us via visualizenyc.net and help us establish a design agenda for our next local administration. I also want to make sure that you are aware that in 2018, AIA National, our parent organization, comprising of around 100,000 members across the world, actually, made climate action one of its top priorities. I was thrilled to serve on the national working group that developed a climate action plan released earlier this year. And the plan asserts that um, we must declare an urgent climate imperative for climate reduction. We must transform the day-to-day -day practice of architects to achieve a zero carbon and equitable, resilient, and healthy built environment. And we must leverage support for all potential partners, including peers, clients, policymakers, and the public. And you can download that full plan at AIA.org. Um, and I think it's so important, right, that architects do declare that they have a role and do declare that they don't have a role only themselves, but as part of a larger group. But now I want to introduce our wonderful speakers today. Um, Lori Kerr, FAIA Lead AP, has extensive experience in urban sustainability policy. She is president of Lori Kerr Policy Lab and a senior fellow at USGBC and a strategic development fellow at CUNY Building Performance Lab, formerly as deputy director for green building policy at the New York City Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability under Michael Bloomberg, Kerr helped develop Plan YC, New York's influential sustainability 
plan. And until recently, she served on the AIA New York board and is still an active member in our organization, advising us on policy and working with our committee in the environment and others. Roger Platt is Senior Vice President for Strategic Partnerships and Growth at US Green Building Council. He is the immediate past president of USGBC also. In addition to his role advising the CEO on mid to long-term strategy matters, he also leads USGBC's Lead for Cities efforts and business development in New York City region. And in addition to the many impressive positions Roger has held and holds, I am particularly proud that he is a board member at the Center for Architecture. But before we hear from these speakers, I am pleased that we will first hear remarks from Professor Jeffrey Sachs. I know Jeff needs no introduction for this crowd, but before I pass to him, I first want to personally acknowledge the incredible work he has done as an economist turned climate action leader via his work at Columbia University and the UN and beyond. Jeff's devotion to affecting change in a sustainable, equitable way globally has elevated his message. In 2017, the Center for Architecture was thrilled to honor Jeff at our annual gala. We were so encouraged by Jeff's message at the event, which I just revisited via video. And I quote from Jeff, architects, city planners, landscape designers, energy engineers, transport engineers are crucial because we have to design places that are wonderful to live in, healthful, and that will secure our planet. Jeff, I cannot tell you how many politicians I speak to who have no idea just how key the work of designers is in helping us live better all while reducing our impact on the planet. Thank you for being such a wonderful advocate for design and a friend to our community. Jeff. Thank you so much. What a wonderful introduction and uh, how great to remember that uh, such kind and exciting occasion together uh, and all the great work that you do. And indeed we do live and uh, prosper based on what architects and planners do. And uh, I'm uh, at, in the Upper West Side right now uh, at home and uh, we live off of a wonderfully uh, designed grid that was uh, designed more than 200 years ago and laid the foundations for Manhattan. Uh, and I'm lucky to be near a central park that enriches lives immeasurably. And so what good urban designers and visionaries do affects our world and our ability to thrive in it. And with 55% of the world in cities today, uh, and that will rise to at least 70, I think even higher than that uh, by mid-century, uh, your work is absolutely essential. And as you're going to hear from Roger and Lori in just a, a moment, it's also essential for our most basic challenge of having a safe climate, not only nice places and productive places to live, but a safe climate because the role of cities in the climate challenge is absolutely huge. Uh, the role of the building sector uh, and the energy used, uh, whether uh, in electrification or uh, direct uh, heating, uh, and burning of uh, heating oil or natural gas, uh, the role of uh, transportation. These are fundamental uh, challenges for the uh, safe climate agenda ahead. We started uh, the project uh, to uh, map out a pathway to net zero emissions by mid-century more than a year ago bringing together Laurie and Roger and experts from across the country, knowing that we would have an election and, an, and a government and I hope to utterly for a new government and we have a new government now, a new president and we have an incoming Congress and uh, President-elect Biden is very clear that we need to reach net zero emissions by mid-century. Uh, I think everybody knows where that guideline comes from. The Paris Climate Agreement calls on the world to make all efforts to 
keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius relative to the pre-industrial level. The IPCC documented that in order to have a likely chance of success, that just means two thirds, by the way, uh, we have to decarbonize by mid-century latest. And of course, uh, under Trump, we were going uh, deliberately from the top in the wrong direction at profound danger to the US and the world. But there has been uh, good news in this awful year uh, of COVID. There has also been good news politically in that Europe adopted a European Green Deal to reach net zero by 2050. And then just in recent weeks, China at the UN General Assembly, President Xi announced reaching net zero by 2060. It's a big commitment. They're gonna even accelerate it, I believe, to 2050. Japan under new Prime Minister Suga uh, and Korea have also announced reaching net zero by 2050. This is all a prelude to COP26, uh, which will be in Glasgow in November, uh, where all nations of the world, including the US as a member of uh, the Paris Climate Agreement once again, must commit to this trajectory of reaching net zero. Our zero carbon action plan, ZCAP, which you can find online and in the chat, you'll find the links to that, uh, is the result of uh, collaboration, as I said, across uh, more than 100 experts across the United States, looking at how the US can do this. Basically, and just uh, within two more minutes, uh, we need to decarbonize the power sector so to move from coal, oil, and gas as power generation primary sources to wind, solar, hydro as the core of the power generation sector. We need to electrify everything that can be properly electrified, including, of course, light duty vehicles and buildings. And we need to use the clean power to produce synthetic fuels, uh, green chemistry, uh, for example, uh, hydrogen uh, loop or uh, synthetic methane or synthetic uh, uh, ammonia or other fuel carriers for certain heavy industrial uses. But the name of the game is clean electricity and electrification to a maximum extent, plus some clean fuel carriers, gas and liquid, made with clean uh, electricity. That's the basic story. We have the time to do it between now and 2050, but we have to hurry. Every new investment has to be pointed in the right direction so that when the old infrastructure rolls off, the new infrastructure that rolls on is clean, green, and oriented to net zero by 2050. We show, and especially our modeling team, uh, shows that the costs of this are extremely modest. Uh, a fraction of 1% of GDP per year to achieve a safe planet and cleaner air and multiple co-benefits of a better life. So it's not a cost at all uh, taken in, in the big picture. And this is the story. We are presenting uh, this uh, to AIA today. Uh, we will be presenting it to members of Congress and of course to uh, Vice President Biden's uh, transition team. Uh, and uh, believe that it can be an important basis for what will be intensive deliberations and policies in the coming year to show the practical pathway to climate safety as part of a world that is taking such efforts together. So without further ado, let's turn it over to the real experts here, uh, to uh, Lori and to Roger. And uh, thank you again, Ben, for hosting today's uh, workshop. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for uh, getting us uh, started. And uh, I was also gonna mention the fact that four major countries had, had all announced recently this uh, remarkable commitment to 2050 or 2060 in the case of China. Um, very uh, bad look for any country to be just, you know, 10 years later on these. So I don't think, well, I don't think it'll stick there for very long. Um, but in all events, 
Um, I want to start by, uh, if we can just go to the next slide, I just want to start by emphasizing that a lot of the, uh, the, the, uh, the way that this overall plan has been developed and the way that the uh, impacts have been estimated um, relate to these four key pillars that are identified here, electric decarbonization, electrifying uh, everything, that's electrification, energy uh, efficiency, and I just want to emphasize here the degree to which the building sector work is very dependent on the work of other sectors. We're very dependent on the greening of the grid uh, in order to accomplish much of what we need to accomplish. Uh, and we're also uh, very dependent on energy efficiency, uh, both in our sector and in the transportation sector. And if we just go to the next slide, I'll explain why that's so important. Here we have uh, a situation where the overall impact of uh, carbon emissions in buildings. And if we're just talking about the actual emissions directly from buildings when they are burning uh, fossil fuels on site, just that alone gets you to 12% of our entire footprint being from buildings. However, when, as in the second graph, you allocate the amount of electricity being used already in buildings, it jumps to 32% of our entire carbon footprint as a country. Now, I, I wanna emphasize how much that is by just mentioning that the residential sector alone, if you just look at the amount of carbon emissions occurring both on site and indirectly through, uh, through the burning of fossil fuels at utilities that serve uh, residential neighborhoods, you have a higher level of carbon emissions than the entire economy of Germany and almost twice the carbon emissions associated with the economy of Brazil. So we're talking about a tremendous amount of, of uh, carbon emissions and we're also talking about an amount for which energy efficiency is going to get us part of the way. And I just wanna highlight in the next slide, if we can go to it, um, just how significant this is. The, this is three graphs which show by 2050, the way that uh, either under a baseline or business as usual approach, under an electrification only approach, or under an approach that includes substantial amounts of energy efficiency and electrification, uh, what, it, what it looks like in terms of electricity use. And you can see that the extraordinary uh, amount of electricity use that will be necessary if everything's being electrified and cars are being electrified, but also their stationary equivalents, buildings are being electrified. The, the upsurge in electricity is huge. And that in the short term can cause a lot of carbon emissions and also can cause greater expense in building out the green grid, huge additional expenses. These graphs from uh, an exercise in the Boston metropolitan area uh, were used uh, by the, the Boston folks to determine that if we just went with full electrification without concurrent energy efficiency, especially in the early years, the costs associated with building out the grid, the tr additional transmission costs, et cetera, uh, could be as much as 300% greater than without uh, the energy efficiency. So just as we are very dependent on the greening of the grid, which will be done by the energy sector, I believe that the overall project is very, very dependent on our accomplishing a great degree of energy efficiency under the models in Jeff Sachs' approach. We're assuming uh, to get to the numbers we want that it'll be a 40% per capita energy efficiency goal. So electrification, yes, possibly even the most important thing, but energy efficiency, a huge piece as well. Next slide. Now, I wanna introduce uh, Lori's portion of this in which she um, will uh, take you in fast and furious style through the, the five key points that we believe are necessary to get to net zero, that what she's talking about are policies that will need to be implemented by an extravagantly complex alphabet soup of agencies at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level. So here in Washington, where I am, the federal government uh, advances the energy efficiency and electrification of its buildings through more than 12 different agencies. And there are different agencies that have huge, huge footprints in terms of their buildings. There are different agencies that deal with private sector buildings that deal with public sector buildings, like the private sector buildings, like the Energy Star program, 
uh, public sector buildings like the Department of Energy State uh, Energy uh, Program. Uh, there are also uh, land use uh, laws that affect transportation and other things related to the built environment. There is also, and this is very important, tax policy that, uh, that does in some cases engender uh, either more uh, carbon emissions because it engenders more of the sprawl type of, of development that we're, that we're experiencing historically, or Fannie Mae has become a, a positive force. It subsidizes mortgages, but it also encourages uh, uh, greener buildings and you can get special treatment if you are an energy star or a lead uh, building. So uh, finally, state, local, tribal territories all have their own building codes. By the way, this is completely untrue in other countries where there's national standards for all of this. And so uh, as you're listening to what Lori has to say, think about the importance of, of the national goal setting. Whatever uh, the challenges that the next president will have with uh, Senator McConnell's Senate, uh, there is great power in the role of goal setting and standard setting at the national level. And that's what um, you'll see from Lori's description is what we're trying to put on steroids um, so that leadership at the top uh, supported and implemented uh, and creatively uh, advanced also at local levels um, can be successful. So with that, I will turn it over to Lori. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I'm gonna, and, and thank you, Ben and Jeff. And now I'm gonna be fast and furious. Um, uh, I wanna backtrack just a little to the four pillars that uh, Roger mentioned and just talk a little bit more, uh, maybe quantitatively about how this works. So uh, this is a, this is a diagram showing how much easier it's going to be to achieve carbon neutrality in the building sector than we all thought it was going to be when we thought we were gonna to have to do most of it through efficiency. In recent years, the grid has started to become much, much greener. And um, now uh, there's electrification on the horizon. For those of you who don't really understand that that well, electrification means that we're gonna stop burning fossil fuels in buildings for heating, uh, hot water, and um, for cooking. And we're going to start to use heat pumps, which are a very efficient, uh, rapidly improving, uh, cost-effective technology. So these two emerging trends, the greener grid and uh, cost-effective, efficient uh, options for electrification now make a much easier decarbonization path possible. So let me walk you through this, how it works. Uh, the bar on the far left shows the relative emissions in the United States from electricity and fuel. The blue part is from electricity, a little over 60%. So uh, let's assume we can electrify about two thirds of that. So that electric part increases and the fossil fuel part decreases. That's the second bar. Why do we say two thirds? Well, it's hard to say, but there are a lot of old buildings. It's expensive to transform them all. Uh, steam heat might be particularly hard and expensive. So just a guess, maybe we, we can achieve two thirds very cost effectively. Then let's say we cut energy use by 25%. We might be able to go to the 40%, but that takes you to the third bar, which shows we're down by 75%. But then here's the magic trick where the carbon neutral grid kicks in. Let's say we get to 90% carbon neutrality. Bang, suddenly all that, uh, all those carbon emissions coming from the grid vanish and we're down to uh, much less than 20% of our original carbon. So it's that one, two, three steps that gets us to very low carbon. Then we have the last mile which we don't know exactly what we'll need to do, maybe carbon neutral gas, maybe carbon sequestration, capture and sequestration, probably some sort of uh, combination of those things, but 
we can, by the things we already know how to do, we can get to very, very low carbon, putting us in a very, very good position by 2035, 2040 to, make, to uh, get to that last mile. Next. So that's technically how we do it. Uh, um, organizationally, how do we do this in an enormous country? How do we make this happen uh, with our 150 million buildings, 50 states and so forth? So we think uh, we need an overarching structure and particularly a carbon, uh, a carbon neutral goal for America by 2050. Um, this does not take Congress to set this. It's like Kennedy said, we're going to the moon. Congress did not have to vote that goal into place. So even without Congress, uh, we can set a carbon neutral goal by 2050, or the new administration can set a carbon neutral goal by 2050. Then I think we need the structures in place to make that happen. Uh, as um, Roger pointed out, there are just multiple overlapping jurisdictions and departments and uh, agencies that uh, will have to all be pulling together in the same direction uh, to make this happen. So we think there needs to be either a White House office or uh, I think Roger and I are in favor of a new cabinet department of climate and resilience that organizes this vast effort uh, including buildings. And then we think the administration has to create a detailed plan uh, that harnesses the federal agencies, the states, and that it should report annually on progress. And the plan that we think will probably have to happen will probably include these five basic strategies that we're gonna outline. One is uh, retrofits in a stimulus package. Another is utilizing codes and standards, leading by example and promoting subnational action, R&D and American manufacturing and using the federal fiscal tools. Next. So first out of the gate, of course, is going to be a stimulus package. And um, we, need, we know we need to jumpstart the economy. And we think that uh, uh, allocating a good portion of that federal stimulus package to renovation and electrification of buildings will make a ton of sense. Uh, first of all, it's very job intensive to uh, uh, retrofit buildings. Secondly, the jobs that are generally uh, going to be created are good jobs. Uh, they're construction related jobs and uh, any, uh, any legislation can make sure that they are equitably apportioned across the population. Finally, they happen everywhere because um, buildings are everywhere. So those retrofits have to happen where the buildings are, they can't be outsourced. So it's gonna be a very even uh, stimulus for every part of the country. We think it should concentrate on two areas, low income housing, uh, to help people who are uh, energy, experiencing energy poverty. And we think that the buildings that serve the general public uh, should also be preferenced because these are the buildings uh, owned by the people. And so if we're going to pay for them, uh, the public hospitals, community colleges and so forth uh, should be uh, preferenced. Next. The biggest single thing though that we probably have to do is to establish a national energy code for zero carbon buildings and uh, push for stronger appliance standards. Um, the reason for this is that codes and standards are really the least cost path to an efficient decarbonized building stock. The reason for this is that um, it's, much less expensive to build it right the first time then it, and add a small incremental cost to put in better low carbon equipment than it is to actually have to rip something out and buy a new product and put it back in. So if we can get the codes and standards right, we're on a very, very low cost path 
to decarbonizing the building sector. How does that work? For new buildings, uh, it's the e they're the easiest part. So we think by no later than 2025, all buildings should be designed to be fossil free and carbon neutral once the grid is greened. And in addition, an awful lot of carbon, we haven't talked about this yet, but an awful lot of carbon is uh, um, produced by the construction of buildings uh, through uh, the, the mining and manufacturing uh, of products used in buildings. So the codes are going to have to um, start to regulate that and start to decrease that. Existing buildings are a little trickier, but they're changing all the time too. Their uh, equipment wears out, uh, windows need to be replaced. And when those things happen, again, is the cheapest time to make it much, much better. So we think the codes are a great tool to make that happen and kind of quietly and inexorably move through that existing stock, making it uh, closer and closer to carbon neutral as each incremental change happens. Finally, uh, appliance standards. Uh, we've had appliance standards uh, that have been uh, adopted at the federal level. In the last four years, they've really fallen behind. So the first thing is to catch up. Second thing is to broaden and capture some pieces of equipment like computers and monitors that were never captured at the federal level. And then also to start to include carbon. Next. Third piece is leading by example. So this has been something that most, uh, the federal government and most progressive state and city governments have done for a long time. They have led by example doing uh, a better job with efficiency um, with their building stock. And this has gone on for many years. Why did they do it? One is that maybe six to 10% of the building stock in the United States and energy produced comes from their buildings. So you can achieve some reductions that way. But the bigger reason is that it transforms uh, the industry. So if you have that big six to 10% chunk of buildings uh, going forward with progressive strategies, then um, uh, you've got a lot of people trained. You've got a lot of um, call for better equipment, which then says a signal to the manufacturers to make more of that, making that much, much cheaper. So it's really the industry transformation aspect of this that it's probably the more important thing. So the federal portfolio, we think it should commit to decarbonization by 2040. And that would include, you know, enormous things like the military, uh, all those fleets of, uh, of um, post office trucks and other uh, trucks, all the buildings, procurement could be a huge piece. Uh, the federal government should assist the state and local portfolios to achieve those same kind of uh, reductions in, a, in an accelerated way. And also, I think the federal, we think the federal government has a, a role in supporting a pro, um, uh, aggressive action uh, in cities and states that want to go further faster in um, more, more um, aggressive uh, legislation like Local 97. Next. We also think that we need to do much more with research and development education and supporting American manufacturing of, uh, of um, clean tech. Uh, right now, about much less than 1% of American uh, research dollars goes into the building sector. Uh, this doesn't cut it. We think that we need to uh, bump that up to something like 5% of the federal budget and start really uh, researching things like uh, carbon neutral gas for buildings because we think there's gonna be a need for that. High temperature heat pumps that might be able to uh, work in buildings that had steam, low carbon construction products and other uh, other products that are going to be, that will, will help us achieve all of this at much, much 
lower trouble and cost. Education, we have to invest in the next generation of uh, building efficiency and carbon professionals. There's really gonna be a lot of jobs in this and we need a really knowledgeable workforce. And finally, we need to really start supporting entrepreneurship and manufacturing in this, even uh, perhaps considering subsidies to American manufacturing to make this happen and resuscitate uh, the Rust Belt and bring back jobs into places uh, that are gonna lose jobs in this transition. Next. Finally, as um, Roger was suggesting, uh, there are a lot of fiscal tools that the federal government can employ. There are always tax incentives. Uh, there could be loans or green banks. And maybe one of the biggest of all are, is, are the mortgage underwriting uh, rules by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And then there are probably many, many other such tools that, that could be utilized. Um, I think that uh, one last thought before I send it back to Roger, we analyzed what would happen. You know, there most a lot of what we put forward, nobody would argue with. Who doesn't like a good stimulus package? But but I think that there might be some people who are concerned about a stronger energy code that includes carbon. So we looked at what if you didn't do that? What if you were weak on that and relied on the few? Uh, progressive states to get you there and kind of lumbered along as we have historically. We found that by the time you get uh, to the end of the road with those policies, you're 35% uh, away from the goal. And that's putting an awful lot of burden on um, possible strategies like carbon neutral gases or um, carbon sequestration and capture strategies that might turn out to be quite expensive. So it seems to us to be quite reckless to um, leave so much to the last mile and much better to um, uh, start addressing this um, soon through better codes and standards where it's gonna be a lot cheaper and a lot more predictable. With that, Roger? Okay, um, can you hear me? All right. Um, thank you, Lori. Uh, and especially uh, important were your comments at the end uh, relative to the degree to which it's possible to take other paths and it's possible to be less aggressive in certain areas, but it's not possible to do that and get to carbon zero uh, by 2050. And again, because all these different sectors are in a sense relying on each other, there is no room for one sector to fail uh, in any significant way. Um, one of the things I didn't mention uh, when I was describing the pie of carbon emissions from the real estate uh, and construction sector was the huge amount, maybe as much as 11 or 12% additional uh, of the carbon emissions associated with the embedded energy uh, based on the life cycle of the construction materials that are used. Now, the reason I didn't mention that is that is implicit in and is theoretically at least included in the industrial portion of the pie chart that you saw. But it's again, something that the real estate industry will need to be uh, taking the lead on. And it's something where again, uh, very progressive codes and specification uh, principles will be really critical to reducing that piece of the puzzle. The other thing I wanted to just hammer on a little bit um, is the last piece of what Lori was talking about in terms of tax and fiscal incentives. Now, this is an area where uh, historically the federal government has produced tremendous subsidies to the real estate industry, which have done a lot of good in terms of allowing more people to afford homes and 30-year amortized mortgages, uh, the tax deduction for interest, etc. There has never been any meaningful condition to doing that. But it seems to me that if we are setting clear standards and goals, there should be a point at which banks begin to be nervous about financing those buildings which are not going to achieve those goals or could be out of compliance with those goals. 
And it's our view that if we could get to the point where, you know, for example, there are now laws uh, in New York City that require that there be grades for buildings, similar laws have passed in other countries. But what's interesting is that in other countries, including, for example, the Netherlands, major banks are now not willing to refinance buildings that achieve lower than a certain score. And so our vision also includes this idea that the remarkably lush amount of money and very attractive tax benefits that real estate has gotten in the past uh, need not be completely uh, disconnected to, to one of the greatest and most important goals of the country, which is to get to, to carbon by 2050. And if we move in that direction, banks will actually get out ahead of the regs. They will be so cautious about uh, lending on buildings that might go out of compliance that in our view, they will start uh, insisting that buildings uh, owners prove that they're doing the right thing. The last thing I wanted to do, which is again, uh, reinforcing a couple of points that Lori's made, uh, really, the first I want to go to is that in general with this exercise, just so people understand, we're only talking about uh, uh, social equity issues largely as it relates to the displacement of jobs caused by this particular project. We haven't really taken on more fully um, the critical issues of poverty alleviation and social equity issues. However, we believe that the real estate uh, piece of this has the greatest opportunity to have that impact as a dividend to the good work we're doing. So in other words, the energy poverty reduction that Lori talked about, if you just look at the way it was done uh, under the, uh, the Obama stimulus package, the, the, the analysis done afterwards was very, very encouraging as to the amount of long-term savings and reductions in energy bills for those who can least afford to pay them. Uh, and secondly, we've done a tremendous amount of analysis relative to the overall job creation uh, if you look at the big picture plan, it talks about 800,000 jobs being created by energy efficiency related issues. 500 almost of those are in the building sector. So 500,000 new direct and indirect jobs every year uh, as a result of the amount of, 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 of economic activity that will be necessary to achieve these goals. So I just want to uh, basically uh, end by uh, pointing out that uh, there's uh, right before the COVID hit, uh, the fastest uh, growing area for uh, new jobs, one of the fastest in the country, was energy efficiency related jobs. They were held by more than 2.3 million Americans, twice the number of jobs held by uh, people in the entire fossil fuels industry. And those energy efficiency jobs were among the most brutally uh, uh, ended by the COVID uh, activity. So we have a lot of people that are trained to do energy efficiency work who could be brought back into the uh, economy in a very powerful and positive way. So with those two points, I will just uh, uh, close by emphasizing, if it's possible to do at this point, that we had a very simple plan. It had five elements, retrofits in a stimulus package. And you heard Lori talk about that, the codes and standards element of it the leading by example and promoting sub-national action, the states and localities, utility programs, uh, an advance in R&D, uh, at least five times the amount of investment that we've had in the past. I think we can do with much more. And then finally, the use of federal and fiscal tools. It's that easy. We think it can be done. And uh, Lori, um, it's been a great pleasure working with you on this. Likewise. Great. Wow. That, that was, um, that was efficient. It was a lot. I sort of had to stop taking notes with my hand. Um, but um, this is great. There are a lot of questions and we have about a quarter of an hour. So um, we'll see how, how rapid fire we can do with the questions. I think it's so interesting. The range of questions, of course, are now like relating to our political changes that are happening and how we're going to support this. And then there are other questions that have to do with the plan itself. Um, just starting with one that has to do a little bit more about, you know, sort of political structures. Um, what are the advantages of creating a climate and resilience department and cabinet position versus appointing a climate czar to work across existing programs at EPA, DOE, et cetera? Any thoughts on that? Lori, do you want to take a crack at it? Otherwise, I'll, I'm happy to answer. You, you'll have to unmute yourself if you are. 
Why don't you take it? Okay. Uh, Lori, Lori and I uh, felt strongly, and of course the Senate to the decision, uh, the, the apparent uh, failure to get uh, a Democratic Senate, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put this on hold for a few years, but we felt it was extremely important that this not all be treated as one of these sort of short-term stimulus things with a czar, as though it's sort of some kind of working group or some issue we're getting through. We're talking about creating an institutional 30-year process with mammoth amounts of new programs at universities, new, new types of jobs we can't even imagine. And we're also talking about uh, having a government that for the first time would really treat this as a statutory priority. Now, in the absence of being able to do legislation on this, it's going to be very important to have an office in the White House that can over time transmute into uh, or ultimately become a, a uh, cabinet level position. But uh, we think anything short of that, a czar really has, uh, it, it makes it feel more like it's a short term uh, challenge. And, and the amount of coordination that is going to be required here is, is, is almost staggering because you're looking at, you know, uh, when you think of the federal departments that are gonna have huge impacts on, on uh, America's carbon footprint, you're looking at Department of Transportation, Department of Energy, EPA, um, education, um, the, the uh, military, of course, with its huge footprint, you know, and on and on and on it goes. Um, you've got to have, you've got to have kind of the administrational muscle, all that goes along with having a department uh, and all those people who are paid to do all those complicated pieces of analysis and, and making sure things actually did happen and measuring the impacts and adjusting the plans. You know, it's just uh, the amount of, um, you know, bureaucratic muscle this is gonna take is really gonna be huge. I just would note that it is a very fair question because of course there are consequences to the, the lack of the Senate and we're happy to talk about that more, although we're here mainly to talk about the substance of the proposal. But you could yeah. keep going on this uh, in the absence of that with, through, a federal, through a White House office and you, right. could, you could create a plan. Somebody asked me, was, uh, 21 for 2020, January 1st, 2021 for the plan. And he was at, uh, Stefan, you were absolutely right. I meant uh, January 1st, 2022, the plan would have to be delivered to the American people of, of how this administration proposes we achieve carbon neutrality. Lori has an interesting parts of footnote that Jared, uh, the president's of Sun Law, will actually be doing the plan by 2021. That, that might be more challenging. There. <laughs> so, um, how about one about uh, something you know within the plan? Um, does the ZCAP have any component component to include embodied carbon, already recognized to be nearly half of overall emissions? tied to a building, depending on the materials used. Uh, and this person's own research is revealing that LCAs are only considering fossil fuel use in material construction, yet emissions due to extraction can far outweigh that. Um, so, and also uh, that wood is rarely a carbon neutral. Yes, we do have several proposals. Uh, the first is that the uh, new energy and carbon code start to capture that. So exactly how that happens, I don't know. Maybe it's a cap per square foot uh, for different types of construction that gradually ratches down, or uh, maybe it's you know maximum amounts of emissions from concrete. There are many ways to do it, but we, we propose for the first time that we shift from a pure energy code, so this is a big change, to be an energy slash carbon code. And that will deal with operational carbon and with embodied carbon. So I should, conceptual, I should sorry. Go ahead. conceptual change there. Go ahead. Mark. I was just gonna say that uh, recognizing this is a very, very sharp uh, group of folks on this webinar, I suspect there are a variety of people, including for example, the chair of the uh, AIA New York's coat that could probably write that provision better than us. So there is, there are people that are deeply committed to this with a lot of sophistication about this. And I suspect some of them are on the call. 
and many of you are going to be necessary to hammer this out in reality. We're just laying down the gauntlet in a way here, very broad brush. And then the second way that we're addressing it is through the uh, research uh, and development uh, proposals that we're making and manufacturing and so forth that, that we really uh, push uh, for research and development in this, not just in better materials, better construction techniques and all of that, but also better knowledge in terms of these uh, embodied carbon and, and better data and, and information on that that could help the industry move forward. We think of it as the embodied carbon discussion as being somewhat in its early phases, whereas energy efficiency is you know, a very, very mature field. So we think that um, a lot of work has to go into making that grow up, but uh, I don't think it's anywhere near too early for, for proposals to go into the codes. Um, there's a question here about demand flexibility. So what role could and should demand flexibility in buildings have to decarbonize? It helps reduce overbuilding renewable energy on the grid, but that is captured in the electricity sector. Uh, does the roadmap factor in that? Well, for, I'd answer by saying absolutely that is uh, factored in. And again, uh, you know, pardon us if sometimes uh, we have given uh, more range to another sector uh, than the building sector on this, because that kind of uh, demand response type of strategy is both a, a real estate strategy, but it's also a big industrial uh, strategy as well. So it's something that it's, it's very much on our minds. And uh, but like a lot of this, it's very challenging, too, because it's going to be so critical, that kind of demand response type of work in the first 10 years. But then as we move to getting a greener and greener grid, we'll have other priorities. But in this period where energy efficiency and, and, and peak load reduction is at its height in terms of prioritization, uh, demand uh, response, one of the most critical ways of addressing the peak load problem. There's one other proposal that we make um, that is that new buildings should be capped in terms of their annual heating and their annual cooling loads, very similarly to the passive house. Mm -hmm. What does this do? It just keeps those additional heating and cooling peaks low, which again, reduces the requirement to create an in increasingly bigger grid. So uh, we think- oh, To, my, to yeah. my friends in the commercial real estate industry, Lori is not saying that if you have multiple floors of trading floors and everything else, that suddenly that's going to have to meet a residential passive house standard uh, that doesn't contemplate that. So anyway, we're not, we're talking about residential principally. No, 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 and, and only for heating and cooling loads, okay. not for other building loads. If we recognize very widely in, core, in terms of, you know, uh, the needs uh, because of the functions that are housed therein. Mm -hmm. But heating and cooling, are, pre, are, are mostly independent of function and can be addressed up front. And it's, uh, we now know how to do it quite well. Um, there's a question, a uh, simple question that I always have. And I think considering we're going into a new administration, uh, this becomes relevant again. Do you have examples in other countries? Remember that? We used to look at other countries um, <laughs> um, that, have, uh, that have been put into place uh, that are maybe similar structure to what you're proposing. Uh, I think particularly just adding to that, uh, dealing with affordable, dealing with public buildings. I'm, I'm just wonder about Nordic countries, other places, are there any examples you're aware of that might be interesting to look at? I will just quickly say that, uh, that, that absolutely in every way we have learned a huge amount. I personally was on the board of the World Green Building Council, which might sound a little esoteric to many people, but it's just a lot of green building councils from around the world. And we learned a tremendous amount from different parts of the world about what they're doing in all of these different areas. Having said that, the United States, as we've all witnessed over the last four, year, over the last four days, is an unusual beast. 
in that every single city, sometimes counties, have their own building codes, have their own uh, laws relative to this, just as they had their own laws related to how to count the ballots. That is not the case in other countries. There are national building codes for most of the countries uh, that we're looking to uh, as models. And so the process of transitioning uh, something in that way jurisdictionally will be will be different than in other countries and, and challenging. All right, well, sadly, I was given the signal um, that this is the last question. Um, so um, I want to thank you both uh, and Jeff uh, and, you know, for this wonderful opportunity to get architects and others involved. I think it's just the beginning, obviously. Um, so we will continue to follow up with more events, get more questions, more discussion going. But um, it's a hopeful moment right now, I think, to be able to think about this, right? To actually think this might really have a chance. So um, wonderful. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for hosting us. Yes, thank you, AIA New York and the Center for Architecture. Yes. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you, guys. And I did want to let everyone know we do have upcoming webinars to uh, dive into the other chapters within CCAP over the next three weeks. We'll be looking at the equitable and just transition uh, tomorrow, um, which talks about our job analysis, uh, policy, and implementation later this week. And then we have more of our sector chapters, materials, industry, and food and land use uh, in the following weeks. Um, these slides and the recording of this webinar will be made available on our uh, ZCAP website that has been entered into the chat several times. Um, so give it a few hours for us to upload uh, our recording, but you will be able to access that after this. Uh, so thank you all again. Thank you, Roger, Lori, Ben, um, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye.